Sherlock Jr. has been my favorite film from the very first time I ever saw it. That would have been about 13 years ago, when I was in my senior year of high school. It wasn't the first Buster Keaton film I ever saw. That was Go West. But it was the one that convinced me he wasn't just an actor with good comic timing, or a clever writer and filmmaker, but that he was a genius. Maybe the greatest genius in all of cinema. I think depending on your personal taste, there are certain things that just click for you, and you respond to them more strongly than someone else might. They resonate more for you than for the average person. And for me, Sherlock Jr. is one of those things. I was already a lover of film when I discovered it, but it was only after seeing Sherlock Jr. that I knew I was to be lost to the movies for life. The best word to describe it, and it, I know, is such a cliché, but the best word to describe it is magic. Sherlock Jr. is magic. So what is so magical about it? Well, the best I can tell you in these few minutes is that at its simplest level, it's a poem to the movies. It's a movie about someone who loves the movies, made by someone who loved the movies. It's the shortest of Keaton's feature films, only 45 minutes long, and for that reason, it's tempting for us to view it as a bridge between the two reelers like One Week and The Scarecrow and the features. But that doesn't really work, because Keaton had already made three features by the time he made Sherlock Jr. And it's only so short, because Keaton cut it way down after preview audiences reacted unenthusiastically. Still, we have the benefit of viewing Keaton's complete body of work, considering his films in whatever order we want, and when we do that, Sherlock Jr. does work nicely as a bridge between Keaton's short subjects and his features. It has more in common with his shorts than his other features, and more in common with those shorts than its brief running time. Keaton loved making shorts because they could be pure comedy. A film like The Boat or The Balloonatic isn't so much a story as an exploration of a premise. To work in a short, a gag only needs to be funny. To work in a feature, a gag needs not only to be funny, but to be justified by the plot. Keaton once said he regretted moving from shorts to features because it meant he had to stop doing impossible things and get the audience invested in his story. With Sherlock Jr., he's able to have it both ways. There's enough of a story to carry a feature, but it's a loose enough story to allow Keaton room to stretch out and indulge in the kind of comic invention he was better at than anyone else. Buster is working as a projectionist at a movie theater and studying to be a detective in his spare time. He's in love with a girl, but is banished from her house after his rival steals her father's watch and frames Buster for it. Buster's sharp enough to see that this guy is up to no good, but he can't prove it even after shadowing him closely from one end of town to the other. Frustrated, screwed over, and with nothing to do about it, Buster returns to work. He falls asleep next to the projector and dreams himself and the major players in his own life into the movie. There isn't enough time here to cover everything, so I'll just mention three elements of Sherlock Jr. that stand out to me. First, the pool playing scene. In Buster's dream movie, he has become Sherlock Jr., the world's greatest detective. His nemesis and his partner in crime intend to kill Sherlock by replacing the 13 ball with an explosive replica. After they make the swap, the villains leave the room and wait for the explosion, which never comes. Despite running the table with a series of amazing shots, Sherlock never so much as grazes the 13. Until the last shot, that is, when Sherlock lines up behind the 13 and... So, how did Sherlock know that the 13 ball was a bomb? And how did he navigate his way past the other death traps they set for him in the billiard room? Was it just blind luck? 
Did he smell something fishy when both guys suddenly fled the room as soon as it was his turn? My guess is it's that last option. He knew about the 13-ball bomb and the other booby traps from the very beginning. After all, it's his dream. Second, this motorcycle sequence. Sherlock's sidekick Gillette shows up to give him a lift, but then, without Sherlock noticing, he falls off the speeding motorbike, leaving Sherlock perched precariously on the handlebars. This leads to a rapid-fire series of classic Keaton stunts, weaving across a busy intersection, riding over a collapsing bridge, crossing in front of a speeding train at the last second, and inevitably to the realization by Sherlock that nobody has been driving the bike this whole time. First he looks at the seat where Gillette should be, then he looks through the camera right at us, like it's our fault for not saying something. Finally, there's the most magical moment in the movie, maybe in any movie. It comes before either of the two scenes I've just mentioned. It's the moment, right after Buster falls asleep at the projector, when he stands up from his seat in the theater and walks into the movie. And it's as simple as that. No big, obvious special effect. No dramatic close-ups or slow motion. He just stands up and steps into the screen. It's no big deal to him. It didn't even feel like a big deal to me when I first saw it, until I stopped and actually thought about what I'd seen. One moment he's watching the movie, the next he's in the movie, and it happens right before our eyes. And it seems like the most natural thing in the world. Maybe that's because Keaton has been subtly preparing us for this point in the film. See the way the shot is set up? It's a frame within a frame, with the inner frame of the movie being projected, surrounded by the larger frame of the theater. And Buster just steps from one frame to the other, from the outer frame to the inner frame. We've already seen this shot in the film. Check out this scene from a few minutes earlier, when Buster and his girl are interrupted by his rival. The girl and the rival leave Buster alone on the couch and go into another room. The shot is just the same here as it will be in the movie theater, an inner frame, the next room, within a larger frame, the room where Buster sits. And when he's had enough of seeing this interloper try to get over with his girl, Buster stands up and marches directly from the outer frame to the inner frame to put a stop to it, just like he does a little later in the movie theater. Keaton shows us frames within frames all through Sherlock Jr. It's the motif that ties the movie together visually, connects Buster's waking life with his dream life as Sherlock, and it reinforces the movie's main theme, that a movie is a magical thing that can show us our dream. But in the end, only we have the power to act and make that dream into a reality. Not bad for a 45-minute movie by a guy in slap shoes and a flat hat. I'm Steve Shives. Thanks for watching.